Okay, let's get some perspective on this witness. Joining me now is criminal investigator Charles Middlestad. Charles, welcome back to Law and Crime. And my first question to you is, what is standing out to you about this testimony? Because it's pretty enlightening. Well, it's certainly in stark contrast to uh, the condition of uh, poor Sterling when he was found at the time of his death. I mean, what this witness, uh, Ms. Shriver, is describing is uh, really perfectly normal sort of interactions with uh, what would appear to be healthy children who uh, are being handed over to her by what at the time seemed to be a, a responsible uh, Miss Harris, right? So there, it's in stark contrast to what we now know about the last few days of, of Sterling's life. There seems to be at least a little bit of different treatment, in my opinion, between Sterling and two-year-old Nyla, who, who, uh, who they mentioned as well. And that's a really interesting point, and hopefully we can talk a little bit more about it. I know we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to be live in that Iowa courtroom. So stay tuned here on Law & Crime. We'll be right back. Okay, as we wait for the next witness, Charles, my question to you as a criminal investigator, does this appear to be a murder to you? Well, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly child neglect and abuse. I mean, there's no question. This is a four-month-old child who uh, obviously can't care for himself, and as all infants, they are 1,000% reliant on, on their guardians, on their parents. So uh, whether it was uh, intentional, I doubt. It sounds to me like we're, we're dealing with someone who is um, in some sort of, who lacks clarity in some sort of altered state and just uh, was not in a position to appropriately care for that child to the extent that it uh, was cruel and inhumane. But um, in all likelihood, we may be dealing with something, uh, some sort of substance abuse issue that would have rendered Miss Harris incapable of, of appropriately caring for her child. Well, Charles, you just laid out all the legal arguments, both for the state and the defense, and it's going to be ultimately up to the jury to determine, is there a mitigating factor here? Is this actually murder? I mean, clearly there was a baby who died. They were responsible to parents, but what level of culpability, if any? Uh, we already know that the father has been found guilty of murder and child endangerment and sentenced to life in prison. So what's going to happen to the mother? Let's go back live. We have a new witness. Okay, let's get some more perspective right now. I'm back here with criminal investigator Charles Middlestadt. Charles, what are you looking for as this case continues on? I mean, with the investigation, we're in the beginning part of it and understanding what happened to Sterling, but what are you looking out for? Well, if I'm part of uh, Ms. Harris's defense team, uh, we're, we're looking to try to establish uh, the mitigation aspect of this case. I mean, the, uh, the, the facts are very straightforward with regard to um, the neglect that occurred um, in the last few days of, of Sterling's life. I mean, you heard from this neighbor who talked about um, prior to that, that by all accounts, he seemed like a, a healthy child and, and he seemed well cared for. And in fact, his rash was getting better. So something changed at some point. And it's trying to identify what that change was, whether it's some sort of mental health status, PTSD, whether it's some sort of substance abuse issue, whether it's some sort of problems within the marriage with Mr. Cohen. Um, those ultimately, I think, well, are yeah. the things that the jury's going to need to hear. You know, it's interesting. Well, yeah, they weren't married. They were together. But the other thing is, is like people can see this and they maybe have their own assumptions of whether what how Sterling was doing or not. We'll have to see. Um, Charles, stand by. I'm signing off. Judge Ashley Wilcott signing on. And she's going to guide you through the next chapter of this case. Stay tuned. from Atlanta, happy to be here. Jesse is done for the morning, but I still have Charles with me, so I'd like to bring you back in, Charles. Talk to me about when you've listened to the evidence and the witnesses they've presented so far, from the very first 911 responder that found the baby to each subsequent person. There was the fire chief, and then there was law enforcement, and they've all described the scene and 
As an investigator, have you had any red flags about, uh-oh, maybe this should have been done differently? Or does it feel to you like it's been standard operating procedure in the investigation of the death? Well, unfortunately, Ashley, I haven't had the benefit of, of listening to all of the testimony in this case, so I am at somewhat of a disadvantage uh, when it comes to that. But um, in, in my reading of the evidence to this point, I didn't see anything or, or nothing jumped out that uh, was deficient. I mean, this is uh, unfortunately a very straightforward case of an extreme child neglect. I've, I've had a few of these cases in my career, and I've never seen one. Um, this extreme, it's it's really um, it, it's it's really hard to to sort of wrap your mind around um, how something like this can happen. I definitely agree with you. You know, I kind of regret I've done child welfare for so many years. I'm a judge in juvenile court, so I see these kinds of cases all too often. So, from my perspective, drug use, mental health issues does not negate that this child has been murdered because the severe neglect caused the death of the child. But tell me from your perspective as an expert, as an investigator, do you think that, that it's fair to say mental health issues, self-medicating, using meth, that those things mean she didn't intend it and therefore she shouldn't be convicted of murder? Well, I think the, one of the obstacles, the challenges for the defense is you have another child, uh, Nala, who is um, under the same care in the exact same environment, and yet she didn't suffer the same fate as poor Sterling. And so this contradiction, this, uh, this contrast is sort of difficult to wrap your mind around again because it's, it's sort of inexplicable. If, in fact, it was some sort of mental health issue uh, or, or some sort of substance abuse issue that caused her to be neglectful, then why would it not have occurred with Nala as well? Right. Now, I completely agree with you. So stay with us, Charles. What we're going to do now is show all the viewers an overview of this case by a package that we've put together. So please watch to get a great summary of the case. A young Iowa mother faces first-degree murder and child endangerment charges in connection with the death of her four-month-old baby, Sterling King. Sterling was found dead and covered in maggots in his baby swing on August 30th, 2017. Authorities say the baby had not had a diaper change, bath, or been removed from the seat in over a week. The parents, Zachary King and Cheyenne Harris, are charged with baby Sterling's death. Authorities first responded to the home that morning after King called 911. He claimed the baby was fed at 9 a.m. that morning and was in good health. But when they checked on him just a few hours later, he had died. The medical examiner ultimately ruled the death as a homicide caused by failure to provide critical care after an autopsy found maggots in various stages of development on the infant. The baby also had an extreme diaper rash and caused E. coli to enter into his bloodstream. Zachary King testified at his trial in November, which we showed here on the Law and Crime Network. He said that Harris was the primary caretaker of the child. Keene was ultimately found guilty after about an hour of jury deliberations and sentenced to life in prison. He is now seeking a new trial. If convicted, Harris also faces life in prison, the mandatory sentence for first-degree murder in Iowa. I'm Rachel Stockman for Law and Crime Network. You know, as Charles already mentioned, it's just a horrible case to hear about and to see in a four-month-old that has suffered needlessly. And I talk a lot about this could have been prevented. And so, regrettably, it's just one that wasn't prevented. And we are now looking at murder charges again against Cheyenne Harris, who is the mother and caretaker of this four-month-old baby. Now, we are going to listen to the very first step in the process of recognizing something was wrong with the baby. That's the 911 call. Let's listen. Utah County, 911. Yeah, is that going? I need an ambulance sent out here to my apartment. Okay, what's your address, Zach? 107 South Hilltop Avenue in Alta Vista. Okay, what's going on? Uh, around 9, my girlfriend went to uh, feed our son, and then uh, about 11 or, or 
11 30 to check on him and he was gone gone meaning he died okay he said, he said uh, probably four months i don't know if it's sudden death syndrome or what okay so you live at 107 south hilltop and eight in alta vista what at, um apartment seven apartment seven okay and your son is four months old and the last time they, they you was checked on was nine no, it was what she said in at nine. Okay. And uh, she had not uh she was a check on her, hadn't heard him cry or whatever, and it was probably about eleven thirty, eleven forty. She uh, went to check on he he passed away. All right, again, that was the nine one one call being played in court and that was Zachary Caretakers. Now, he has been convicted. Law and Crime did cover his trial. He has been convicted. He has received the mandatory life sentence for murder in the first degree in that state. Now, he said she was the caretaker. It's her fault. Cheyenne Harris failed to take care of this baby. Jury didn't believe it in his case. Now, Charles, talk to me about the 911 call. First of all, as an investigator, the tone of his voice, his demeanor on a 911 call, when he's calling to say a baby's dead, what did you make of it? Well, it's, there, there doesn't uh, appear to be a lot of emotion there, Ashley. And, and we also know from a previous prosecution witness, Ms. Shriver, the, the neighbor who actually cared for uh, baby Sterling on a couple of occasions, that prior to this call even being made, she found him outside smoking a cigarette, and he made a spontaneous statement to her about the fact that um, Sterling was gone, and she's the one who actually encouraged him um, to make the 911 call. And we he also hear during, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go. During the call, we also hear him um, making some statements about the timing. And these are things that ultimately, I think, contributed to his conviction in that he's putting himself on the record as to the last time he checked on Sterling and, the, and uh, details about the last time Sterling was fed, even offering a potential defense, as, you know, is this sudden infant death? Um, syndrome, uh, when clearly it's not even in the, in the zip code of, um, of SIDS, right? And so um, th those are the things that, you know, it's almost like a, a client who's made a statement, uh, uh, subjected themselves to an interview uh, with law enforcement. It's one of the first things we always want to know, right, when we um, take on a case is, hey, did you make a statement? And, and this is the equivalent of that, and he's provided some detail that he has to, to, to deal with. And here are the most damning. To deal with. Right. And I'm sorry, twice I've interrupted you because here's the thing that really incenses me about this type of crime. That is, here he says on 911, I don't know if it was sudden infant death. I don't know what happened. But you hear the witnesses testify in his case and now in Cheyenne Harris's case, and they all describe that there were bugs flying out, that the clothes were crusty, that the little fist was by the face and the arms were stiff, underweight. All of these things that are very um, visible. You can see it. There's no doubt to me if you were to look at that baby, you could tell something was wrong. Yet he's calling with the baby in his house saying, oh, yeah, I don't know what happened to the baby. I mean, how do you reconcile that? I don't think you can. I think that's probably why the jury deliberated for an hour before convicting him. But another thing, too, Ashley, is smell. I mean, not only can you can you see these things, but I think the jury uh, has has to be left with the with the notion that there's no way that you couldn't smell that. I mean, anybody who's ever had a, a child or cared for a baby um, knows that within moments of uh, having a soiled diaper, you can smell it. In fact, that's how you sometimes know. So the notion that a child could be sitting um, in his own feces for days on end, and that would not be just obvious and, and uh, the odor wouldn't overtake not just the room but maybe even the entire house uh, I don't think anybody you know can sort of reconcile that that wasn't the case right well I you know I appreciate you bringing out that detail I know this is a very hard case to listen to and the facts are just really egregious but it's always important to cover these cases because of the search for truth and seeing what happens in our justice system and accountability. So we're going to take a short break. Charles will still be with us. We're going to return in just a moment. So 
So they are taking a lunch break. We are going to join the McStay family murder trial, but not quite yet because I have my guests here. Charles is still with us, but we also have trial attorney Imran Ansari. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let me start with you, and then I want to ask Charles a couple of the investigation questions. So we're hearing from the grandmother of Sterling, the four-month-old right now, and she is saying, um, you know, the child came home from the hospital. They stayed with her. After that, he seemed to be okay. She saw some pictures. Pictures. He was kind of fussy. He would eat. How realistic is it to believe if you're mounting first take the prosecution's position that she honestly never saw changes in the baby or had any idea that this was going downhill fast in terms of Cheyenne's care of the baby? Well, you have to think about uh, the state of this baby and this this case. I mean, shocks the conscience all levels. You got to think about the state of the baby uh, at the time of death. We have the autopsy report, we have the uh, investigation and police testimony regarding uh, the condition of the baby uh, at the time it was discovered that the baby was deceased. And you have to really uh, question, could you not see the telltale signs of a child with such neglect? So, and you also have to think about the bias. This is the defendant's mother. So that's going to be some, uh, uh, definitely a point that's going to be hit home. There's an inherent bias. I mean, you're going to expect that the mother of the defendant is going to testify in a way that is helpful to the defendant. And just the state of the child at the time of death, it's hard to believe that those signs weren't uh, noticeable. All right, I don't disagree. But Charles, let me ask you this. So you notice in her testimony, she said, nope, she did not like Zachary Cohen. Her fiance didn't like him. She didn't like him. There was history there. How much do you think in your um, all the investigations you've been involved with, how much does that affect how much time a relative may or may not spend with a child and therefore may or may not really realize what's going on in the home? A substantial factor in the in this tragedy, um, Ashley, if there had been uh, more closeness and had Zachary been welcome in grandmom's home and vice versa, you know, potentially there would have been um, greater care, more monitoring of, of Zachary, and this tragedy may not have occurred. So, you know, when I was listening to that testimony, I thought, well, this is a significant factor uh, in in this in this tragedy. Um, also, you know, the testimony in conjunction with the neighbors paints this picture of a normal child who verbalizes when he needed. Um, when he was hungry, when he needed a diaper change. And so I think that's actually very helpful to the, the defense because ultimately what they want to do in order to forward this, either this PTSD or this um, any some sort of depression defense or whatever, is to shrink it down and say, look, this was a normally attentive, good mother, and then suddenly something occurred, something went off the rails in a very short period of time. Maybe it was as little as a week, maybe 10 days, maybe two weeks. And sadly, everybody failed this child. The, everybody around this child failed to recognize the signs. All right. And I know that babies are born out of a hospital all the time. However, I couldn't help but note that she also had this baby in a bathtub. So we will be returning to that trial once it comes back to court. They are on a lunch break. Now, like I said, we're going to join the Merritt case now. And let me just bring you up to speed. It's been back in trial for a little bit now. Smith was on the stand. I'm not sure if that's still the witness on the stand. But one of the things that he testified to that I want our viewers to know about, if you've been following online, is that he had gotten a tip. Law enforcement had gotten a tip saying that Kavanaugh had done a search on Joseph McStay's computer and a tip that Kavanaugh had actually killed the family, taken them and buried them. So um, he was asked, this witness on the stand, Smith is still on the stand, if he had spoken to Kavanaugh about that and his answer was no. So let's join that testimony now. All right, so we're taking us, they're taking a sidebar, so we pulled back out while they're doing that. And I just can't help but mention again, I think it's huge points for the defense that you now have a witness say, we did receive a tip about Kavanaugh being the one who actually killed this family and took them to the grave sites. We did not speak to Kavanaugh about that. Let me ask one of our guests, I'm going to start with you here with me as a defense attorney, trial attorney. What does that do for the defense in terms of potential reasonable doubt? Talk about a win for the defense. If they bring that home, if they flesh out that testimony, reasonable doubt. 
that is a huge sliver, not just a sliver, a big cake of reasonable doubt. That if I was the defense, I would run with that. I will keep that in my pocket for summation, and that in itself, I mean, that is a critical piece of evidence um, regarding the identity of the uh, alleged killer. They didn't flesh it out. This witness could have, may have, tanked the prosecution's case right there. And I agree with you, Imran. And remember, in the opening statements, the defense said, you've got the wrong person. And they even pointed their finger at Kavanaugh. So this kind of spoon feeds that into this. Now, I got to ask you, Charles, when you hear that, as an investigator, does it bother you at all that they did not look into Kavanaugh? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, this this is, by the way, is just the second serving of incompetence in this case. And when we previously heard from Detective Duval, who's the homicide investigator, and he is the one who initially, despite the fact that you have five family members that are have disappeared without a trace, without notifying family members, friends, anybody else, he treats this as a missing persons case and does not secure the scene. The family members go in there and they do some cleaning and they completely contaminate the crime scene. And now you have Detective Smith who uh, testifies to the fact that they received this tip. He doesn't follow up on it. This gives the defense exactly what they want with regard to forwarding this alternate suspect theory. If you're going to do that, if you're going to mount that sort of defense, you want to be able to point to somebody specifically, and they just really did most of the heavy lifting for the defense through this uh, major, major error in their investigation. So let me play devil's advocate and ask you this, Charles. We know that this event was almost 19 years ago. February is when this family was last seen of 2000. In 19 years, has standard operating procedure, how cases has handled, has it changed? Could it be that the detective at the time did what he was trained to do, or did they drop the ball? In my opinion, they, they dropped the ball. Yes, there are certain procedures that have changed, but with regard to the policy or, or how you approach uh, five missing persons. This is not a missing person case. This is a missing persons case when Detective Duvall receives it. If that doesn't, five people just disappearing out of thin air, if that doesn't cause concern um, and cause you to look at this in a very different light than a typical missing person singular case, then there's something wrong. And that's where I find fault with uh, Duval. Now, he, he's not a, a responding officer. He's a homicide investigator. There's a reason that they pull him into this, because they know on the front end there's a possibility that something nefarious has occurred. And so the failure to secure that scene and to conduct uh, critical in, uh, interviews up front is ultimately why I think this case is going to result in a, in a not guilty. This is a very much an uphill battle for the prosecution in this case, based upon the way they proceeded. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Imran, if you're the prosecution, what do you do to save it now? What do you do with this testimony? How do you handle it to try to pull it back out of the tank, so to speak? Right. Well, I think the best way is to uh, sort of deflect the attention from Kavanaugh uh, as a, a possible other suspect and focus it back on the defendant at trial. It's going to be hard to do that, and you've seen countless cases which result in an acquittal when an investigation is flubbed. One, one big point is a flubbing of the uh, initial investigation of the crime scene. We had that here. You know, we had those. Uh, we're relying on photographs of supposed splatter on a table uh, that was never preserved. That could be coffee. That could be anything else. So the defense has a lot of uh, ammo here to go at it when they're bringing their case in summation. And really, to, to deflect it, what the prosecution has to do is bring it back to merit. You're going to hear probably a lot about Kavanaugh, at least from the defense, on cross-examination and, and sort of a building up that in that seat and they're gonna have an uphill battle doing that and they keep harping on and bringing up the fact that um, the financial motive for this defendant to have been the one that actually killed the family so stay tuned we're gonna take a short break but we will be returning to live coverage of both of these trials as they resume court stay tuned
right, so Detective Smith is still testifying, and right now he's testifying about whether or not he was able to figure out where the, sister, the defendant's sister lived. His answer was yes. Now they're looking at the graves in the desert. I'd like to bring my guest back in. And Charles, I want to ask you, so you had this discussion with this witness about the futon cover and whether or not it was the futon cover. He says, I can't say whether it was or not, but in the pictures, futon cover has zippers. The, the uh, articles in the graves did not have zippers. All of that, to me, means they're talking about did it happen in the house or not. I want you to share, I know we were talking about on break, in your opinion, if that three-pound sledgehammer is the murder weapon, in fact, and the prosecution states they were killed in the home, based on what you know so far from witnesses, do you think that's even possible that they were killed in the family home? No, I, I, I can't even begin to imagine that being the case. Just based upon my experience and familiarity with uh, in, in this case, what would be um, blunt, blunt force trauma from the three-pound sledgehammer. You're talking about the, the potential and the likelihood of a lot of biological evidence, not just in the form of blood, but you can have bone fragment. Um, you're talking about a very gruesome, a very, very bloody um, crime scene. And there is simply no way that one individual, for, first of all, could even carry that out. That's not, it's not a gunshot. It's I mean, you're talking about running around and hitting people with a sledgehammer. But um, based on the timeline that the prosecution has established, which is roughly three hours from the time that um, Chase would have to go from his house to the crime scene and back, um, there's, this would be a cleanup that would take perhaps even days to sufficiently clean up. And even at that, if you were a crime scene technician and you understood uh, crime scene cleanup, you still wouldn't be ad, uh, able to adequately clean it up. There would still be some residue that would be able to be picked up through luminol. You know, the, you know other, as we listen to Detective Smith, we, we see at times he's almost like a deer caught in headlights. He's, he actually testified more about the uncertainty about evidence. I mean, he's really just forwarding a reasonable doubt. He's handing it to the defense on a silver platter. And then he, he opines on something that is demonstrably false with regard to this futon cover. He talks about how he believes it is, and, and, but he adm admits that there's a zipper on it and there was no zipper found. So it's not helpful at all. This is a death penalty case. And um, you know, it, it, as unlikely as juries are these days to award the death penalty um, based upon um, exonerations and wrongfully convicted cases, uh, this is uh, a situation where you have a lack of connectivity between the evidence. Absolutely. And they are making this really, really difficult on themselves. All right, so Imran, I'm going to put you in the shoes of the prosecution again. What do you do after hearing Charles' description of this detective and what's bothersome and hands it to the defense as prosecution? What do you do with this detective other than try to get him off the stand? Right. I think it's uh, needless to say that Detective Smith is not the best witness for the prosecution. In fact, he's really making out the defense case here. Um, this is a circumstantial case. And when you have a circumstantial case as the prosecution, you want all those dots to be connected. You want to connect each dot of each piece of circumstantial evidence connecting the defendant to that crime. You want them to sort of seamlessly connect. That's not happening here. We're getting bits and pieces of evidence through testimony, Detective Smith's testimony, uh, that the evidence found, let's say the futon covers, uh, the ones at the house, don't match up to the ones found at the burial site. Um, that's another piece of reasonable doubt that the defense should really hit home. And it's not good for the prosecution. You know, they have to connect those dots, that circumstantial evidence. Detective Smith is making it very, very hard for the prosecution to do that. All right, so we're going to see what the jury does. Again, they have to find that she should be, uh, excuse me, he should be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the standard in a criminal case. Charles Middlestead, I know that you need to leave us now, but we appreciate so much your being here with your great analysis. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And we are going to take a short break, but don't miss these two trials we continue to cover here on Law and Crime Live right after this break.